Welcome to Dismantling Injustice, the podcast of Envision Freedom Fund. I'm Julie Menti, Envision's Communications Manager, filling in as host for our Executive Director, Carl Hammett Lipscomb. Right now in New York City, there are 6,157 people being jailed in the Rikers Island Jail Complex. Let me hit you with some more numbers about Rikers. 87% of the people there are being held pre-trial. That means their cases are still pending. They have not been convicted or exonerated or taken a plea. More than 90% are people of color. At least 55% have some symptoms of mental illness. And finally, 28 people have died while in custody of New York's Department of Corrections in the last two years alone. These numbers should be more than enough evidence to prove that our city jail system is unjust, racist, and even deadly. Yet judges and DAs continue to send members of our communities to Rikers, and the mayor and the Department of Corrections remain unable and unwilling to decarcerate and close these inhumane facilities. Today we're joined by Darren Mack, the co-director and co-founder of Freedom Agenda, and Larray Hodge, one of Freedom Agenda's member leaders. Darren is a survivor of both Rikers and the New York State prison system. For more than 10 years, he's been advocating for the closure of Rikers and defending the rights of incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people. Loray, whose son is currently jailed in Rikers, has been advocating for closing this facility and demanding accountability from the city. We are privileged to share with you this conversation about the humanitarian crisis at Rikers and our shared determination that New York City needs to put money and resources into community hands instead of into jails. I'll be right back with Darren Mack and Loray Hodge. Over the last eight years, Envision Freedom Fund has paid more than $10 million to free individuals in pretrial and immigration detention. A big thank you to all of our donors who help us to pay this much too high price for freedom. At Envision Freedom, we know that paying bail or bond will never be enough on its own to end the humanitarian crisis that is incarceration and surveillance of Black, Brown, and immigrant communities. That's why we also fight to dismantle the systems that harm these communities in the first place. If this sounds like the transformative change that you believe in, you can join us. Visit our website, envisionfreedom.org, or click the link right on our Spotify profile to donate to our work. Because freedom for all people will take all of us. And now, back to the show. Thank you so much, Darren and Lorraine, for joining us. Darren, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and what brought you into the fight to decarcerate New York City and be a defender of human rights of incarcerated people. Yeah, so thank you so much for having us. Uh, My name is Darren Mack. I go by he, him pronouns, and I'm a co-director at Freedom Agenda, which is a member-led organization dedicated to organizing people and communities directly impacted by incarceration to achieve decarceration and system transformation. You know, I'm a Brooklyn Knight um, and born and raised in Brooklyn in the old Bushwick. What got me to, into this fight uh, at the age of 17, I was incarcerated at Rikers Island when the population was over 20,000 people detained there. And coming home, you know, after, you know, almost you know, 19 years within the New York State prison system to see, you know, the conditions, uh, the inhumane treatment and violence was still plaguing Rikers Island, you know, almost two decades later with, you know, less than half of the population. I know that, you know, something had to be done, you know, from, from you know, people who've been impacted by, by, you know, Rikers Island. And I got into this fight um, about almost eight years ago and now leading the campaign to close Rikers along with over 170 organizational partners partners throughout New York City to bring the closure of Rikers Island to its finish line. And and Larray, I know you're you're a member of Freedom Agenda. Can you tell us a little bit about um, how you got involved in, in this work? For some strange reason, I had seen like an email or something. So I registered I don't know where I got it from, but I registered and sometime 
in the future, um, Darren Mack had called me and we talked and um, he got to know what my concerns were and I became a member and I've been connected ever since. That's great. And why was it important for you to want to be involved? Well, because I I have a son and he's been a couple of times on Rikers and um, it's just been a little disturbance why um, I wanted to get involved. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit first, um, Darren. You use the term decarcerate a few times, and uh, you and I had spoken earlier about how some people might not understand that word and, you know, just want to make sure that people know what that means. Can you talk a little bit about um, what decarceration is and, you know, sort of where we are now in terms of how Rikers is or is not being decarcerated? Yeah, so like from my perspective, I think of decarceration on two or three fronts, and that's preventative, deterring people, off-ramping people from incarceration in the first place. Like right now, we have a population of of approximately 6,000 people detained on Rikers Island. Um, Half of that population, a little over half of that population has a mental health diagnosis. And and ninety percent of them uh, have a serious mental health diagnosis. So we believe that you know people who have mental health challenges should be getting treatment, not jail. And you know there should be you know mental health resources you know in the communities you know where people could to access uh, to address their issues. And and that's one preventive way to decarcerate off ramping people you know and prevent the people from being entangled in the criminal legal system in the first place. And then for those who are uh, detained um, on Rikers Island, you know, decarcerating by by releasing people to you know, alternatives to incarceration and alternatives to detention and, you know, and to, you know, to those community-based programs and services where they could get the services that they need. You know, 90% of the people uh, on Rikers Island are there pre-trial, meaning they haven't had their day in court yet. And, and, and one of the main reasons why they remain, you know, detained is because they have bails that can't afford, they can't afford. And, and I think that's a, a, a wealth based issue and, and which is problematic in its, in, the, in its roots. And then for those who are returning, you know, back to, you have people there serving city sentences, like of one year or less, you know, why can't they do that? You know, at home, at an alternative cost of racial detention program, and they could go to school and and go to work, and you know, and take some type of program, you know, to to, to address you know whatever their whatever their issues is. So, so decarceration happened on you know all those fronts, and, you know, and more. And that's just a little slip of, of what I understand you know decarceration to mean. Yeah, and I, and I want to add too, we've done a lot of organizing and advocacy with Freedom Agenda about judicial accountability and holding judges and DAs accountable for um, the decisions they make that funnel more people into Rikers when it doesn't have to be that way. So let's talk about Rikers at, itself. You know, we know it's been in the news constantly about unsafe conditions and inhumane conditions. Um, 19 people have died in New York City jails in 2022, um, and at least nine people have died in DOC custody this year. Um, you know, so what what are the th- what are the day-to-day realities that the general public might not know um, about what people are experiencing at Rikers or just might not know about Rikers at all? For me, I I, you know, I, I go visit my son, but not all the time because for one is, is the setup and with the whole search is too long. Um, by the time you go visit your loved one is not set up in a safe environment. Um, it just doesn't feel like it was safe. So the last time I visited my son, I didn't stay the whole visit. I felt it a little uncomfortable. Um, 
since my son been in there, he's got stabbed twice, once in the face and one in the arm. And he, um, he think he, he, he's not stable enough to make right decisions and choices. He needs, he needs help. I don't think he needs to be in there. I think he needs to be in a rehab program because what got him in there is subsidence due to the fact of his, you know, his history of his life. It's, it's you know, it's a lot of them, like uh, Darren has said, it's, there's a lot of them that's in there that suffers with mental health and the reason for mental health is they self-medicating uh, themselves with marijuana, whatever type of drugs that they use. And their behavior comes after that. So instead of them evaluating the problem, they just lock everybody up. So it's a mixture of different things that's in there instead of trying to find out the history of what is really going on. Do you feel like your son has been receiving any medical care, mental health care, or anything since he's been inside? Well, he haven't mentioned anything about getting any of those type of cares. Mm -hmm. He's traumatized, to be honest. He's He's been through a lot. He haven't really had a childhood life. He's been from psych medication to hospitalization to residential and then incarcerated. So, um, he doesn't really have a, a, you know, he doesn't have a life to experience what it's like to, to live. How old is your son? He just turned 23 in October. Wow. Wow. And what, what kind of impact has this had on you? Because it's certainly, you know, the, the trauma of what he's experiencing extends outward. This is trauma for not just me, but for the whole family on both sides, because he, the system failed a lot of us. When we really needed help, we really needed services to help us, to keep us all connected. No one was there. We had, you know, a lot of us, like myself, have to sit up there and try to figure out how to, how to cope with this stuff. So it's trauma. It's a lot of traumatizing in my family. Yeah. What kind of support would you like to see for your son and for other people who are in the same position as him? I feel like they should have like some type of advocacy, social services. Most of majority of them that's incarcerated, they they have nowhere to go. They and then when they want their own, when they get a certain age, they can't get housing. He was in a shelter. He had a voucher, but he didn't. He wasn't successful to get a place to stay. So it makes people more violent. It makes people more depressed. Then people start doing drugs and stuff, and then you got a got a criminal situation on the streets and. Um, this whole the whole system is is a is a backwards a backwards thing, you know. We don't have nobody that sits to really listen to what families are going through. Yeah. And if they hear the story, then they know how to help people. Yeah, and I think you you've raised some really great points, Larray, of of how it's a multi system failure. Um, you know, in terms of not just the criminal system, but of our healthcare system, of our social service system, of our shelter system, um, and that, you know, to really see long-term change and to see people be able to be free and to thrive, that we need to address all of those systems. Darren, can you can you talk a little bit more about you know, some of the things the general public might not know or understand about Rikers that you think are really important for people to know and understand? Sure. Um, so, you know, Rikers Island is a jail, jail complex with 10 jails um, on 400 acres, over 400 acres of land. Um, listeners may have heard that, you know, 
New York's infamous penal colony. Um, you know, it's a penal colony like Alcatraz was a penal colony that closed decades ago, and McNeil Island in Washington, which closed um, in the early 2000s, leaving New York City to have Rikers Island, last penal colony in the United States. So it's scheduled to close thanks to survivors of Rikers, such as myself, family members of people who experience Rikers, like Murray, and allies in the campaign to close Rikers. And, you know, listeners probably also heard that it's currently in a state of urgent an, a, a urgent humanitarian crisis with more people dying there every month, thousands of missed medical, um, medical appointments, and jail guards who aren't accountable to no one. Both of these are true, you know, and it's crucial to address, you know, the immediate conditions there while continuing the work of closing records for good. And and how we, we're going to get it done is thanks to the work of directly impacted people, you know, by the brutality of records and our allies. You know, New York has a legal obligation to close the jails on records by August 31st, 2027, and plans to place, you know, both to reduce incarceration capacity and repurpose Rikers for green infrastructure in the future. But, you know, we can't leave, you know, thousands of people in the current conditions of Rikers for for another four years. So, you know, as was mentioned earlier, uh, you know, 28 people have lost their lives uh, since this administration came into office in January 2021. And we need to reduce incarceration now or, you know, we are on pace to lose more lives. So anyone hearing our voice or LeRae's voice, you have family members and loved ones and friends on Rikers Island. Uh, we need to get involved, you know, with Freedom Agenda and the campaign to close Rikers so we can address, you know, the roots of incarceration that, that to close the pipelines that feed Rikers Island. Yeah. And we'll make sure to drop in the show notes uh, the link to Freedom Agenda website and the Close Rikers website. Um, you know, and speaking about sort of decarceration and how we can um, prevent people from even going into the Rikers complex at all, um, you know, Darren, how do you think, you know, public perception of safety and who deserves safety is contributing to, you know, people being funneled into Rikers and also the conditions there? Yeah, that's a great question. So people have to know, understand that, you know, over the 90% of the population, you know, on Rikers Island are there pre-trial. And if we believe in the presumption of innocence, we have to give that to everyone, you know, uh, the, you know, even included those on the Rikers Island who, you know, haven't had their day in court. And unfortunately, um, this mayor, if you was to listen to him, you know, he made statements very uh, concerning and fear mongering statements as if the people detained on Rikers Island are guilty just because they've been arrested. And and that's not the and and just threw away, you know, the presumption of innocence. You know, I'm sure many listeners probably heard of the case of Khalif Browder, you know, uh, who was on Rikers Island for three years without, you know, uh, and and, you know, and the trauma that he went through. Uh, after he was released, after three years, uh, they they dismissed the case, and because of the trauma, he took his own life. Laylene Polanco, you know, who haven't who didn't have her day in court, you know, died on Rikers Island. So many names, so many, so many, you know, that we could, you know, people probably heard of. And I think that, um, you know, we need to like do better if we believe in uh, human rights and we believe in civilization. We and, and justice. Um, we need to treat people, you know, accordingly, you know, with the presumption of innocence. And and, and like Larray mentioned, you know, half of the people on Rikers have mental health issues. You know, Jordan Neely was released from Rikers out of fifteen months, and she said, you know, Larray said the system's failed. You know, Neely. There's a lot of Jordan Neelys that the system has failed. You know, and like Larray's son as well is an, as an, another another one. And we could do better by investing in communities, deep incarceration, and um, you know, doing what we know that brings actually enhanced community safety, like you know, housing, like uh, mental health services, and, and, and such. Yeah, and addiction services, and 
um, you know, any number of community-based programming that could really prevent people from having to experience the, the trauma of incarceration. You know, in addition to sort of the, the very present dangers of, of Rikers, there's also something looming underneath the surface that um, is both a, a metaphor and very real um, of there being toxic waste on, on the island. Um, and, you know, can you, can you explain sort of the issue with the foundation of, of Rikers and, you know, sort of what you have in mind with Freedom Agenda and others to um, envision a renewable Rikers? Yes. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, Rikers Island, you know, sits on over 400 acres of land. But the, the vast majority of it, about, I want to say, yeah, the vast majority, like 90% of it, is actually landfilled. And, you know, this landfill is toxic. Um, so toxic, they used, they had um, methane gas. It emits methane gas. And they had methane gas along. They used to go off every day. And they basically just shut it off. And, you know, there's ever, even been uh, civil suits, you know, against the city from the uh, Department of Correction staff uh, um, making a claim that they actually got cancer from drinking the water. Like, I remember um, being a volunteer, you know, for some adolescents on Rikers Island for a pilot project program. And for the first time in my life, I saw a sign, you know, coming in as a volunteer that says, do not drink the water. And this is something I never heard of even during my incarceration on Rikers Island, and you basically are forced to drink of water. There's no warning about it, you know, whatsoever. So, you know, as we move forward, you know, a lot of people always have a lot of questions about, you know, what are, what's going to happen to Rikers Island, you know, afterwards um, it's, it's shut down. And there's a campaign called Renewable Rikers, um, which is a campaign with criminal legal of justice advocates and environmental justice advocates um, to to order to in order to repair the harms of of Rikers Island for people who've been you know suffered from it. We believe that in a renewable Rikers, where you know communities across the city have these things called peaker plants, and these peaker plants operate like batteries. So when a city is utilizing a certain uh, a high level of energy. Um, in power, the these peaker plants kick in, so the city won't black out, and and it's mostly like utilized during the summertime. And then, so but the problem is, is that these these peaker plants are toxic; it exudes toxicities into the atmosphere, and they're mostly in, in predominantly black and brown communities of color and and, and working class, low income communities. So. A renewable Rikers would, you know, with with you know clean energy, sustainable green energy, will help remove these peaker plants, you know, all across from our city, and and we could have a green sustainable energy to power the city instead of these peaker plants, and that's the vision for renew for for renewable Rikers. That's amazing. Um, you know this this plan and and so much of what you're doing at at Freedom Agenda is sort of in you know, honoring and transforming the pain and trauma that have been caused by Rikers. You know, what are the successes or, you know, hope that you see that this transformation is possible, that we can make this happen? Yeah. So, you know, successes like I might have mentioned in 2019, um, you know, advocates and you know, survivors of Rikers and allies you know, push the city to adopt a plan to close Rikers Island and address conditions of confinement um, and shrinking our carceral footprint. And in 2021, um, the Renewable Rikers Coalition got the Renewable Rikers Act passed, uh, which is consists of three pieces of legislation. The last piece of legislation is, you know, the city by law has to every six months make a determination of what land or facilities are not being utilized by the Department of Corrections. And if that determination is made, that land or facility 
is transferred to the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. And since that legislation had been passed, we had over 40 acres of land and two facilities for the first time in the Rikers history be transferred from the Department of Corrections to the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. So what gives me hope is those family members, you know, those survivors of Rikers who are in this fight, you know, advocating, organizing for not just for themselves, but for the next generation that they won't have to experience um, Rikers Island ever again. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's one of the most powerful things about doing this work is, you know, meeting the people who have experienced Rikers firsthand and their families. And, you know, they're, they're not fighting just for themselves. Um, you know, it's a real testament to solidarity and community that one of the first things anybody says is that I want to make sure that no one else experiences what I experienced. I think we need more of that. We can learn a lot from that sort of very unselfish, community-focused approach to taking care of our of ourselves, of our city, and of the people who live in it. Absolutely. Lorraine, you've told us so much about about your son and what he's experiencing um, and some of the circumstances that have, have led to um, him being in Rikers. But I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about who he is as, as a person, you know, and what, what you hope for him. Sure. Well, my son is a young man that grew up without a father figure in his life. Um, he was four months old when his father had got murdered. And then his grandfather was um, a father figure and he got sick and then he passed away. And he grew up angry because he didn't have a father figure in his life. Um, so he went to different behaviors. He had an IEP. Um, he been just trying to find his way. And all I can do is just sit there and try to be a, a support. Me and his aunt is, is his most strongest support that's there for him because he really don't have any male figure in his life. So I'm hoping in the future that he will get another chance to try to be the man that he should have been a long time ago. And, and um, cause he's also a good person, you know, he have a good heart. It's just that he's just been hurt through the way he was raised without a father figure. Is there anything that gives you hope that this will change for your son and for others? My hope is I keep praying. I'm just keep praying and, and, and hoping that God will place not just my son, but a lot of people, families that's in there for the right services that they need. Because everybody don't need to be behind bars. People is going through trauma stuff that was never addressed it. And everybody is like walking over it like it's a doormat. Yeah. Lorraine, is there anything that you wanted to talk about or wanted to say that we didn't get a chance to touch on? Well, my main, my biggest thing is that service the people where they need to be serviced at, even if it's a mental health hospitalization or a rehabilitation, you know, not everybody, you know, they have to talk to the person that's in there and talk to their families. Get a get a history of what's you know, a history of why the people are doing what they're doing. You know, try to help them. And the sad part about it is is this is budget cuts to where the, the the things that we need we 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 having a hard time getting. Yeah, yeah. Darren, is there is there anything else that you wanted to talk about that we didn't touch on? One thing I'll say is that any you know any family member, any survivor of Rikers who hears this podcast, any you know concerned New Yorker that hears this podcast, and you know they believe in human rights and justice and basic minimum standards for people who are detained in our system, you know, join Freedom Agenda. You know, you could go to, you know, our website to learn more about, you know, our work at fa.urbanjustice.org. 
or you could go to the campaign to close rackets.org and join this coalition that's doing this Herculean task, I guess the word is, uh, to, to move this finish line to close this last bit of Kali in the United States. Yeah. And Darren, you probably don't remember this, but I first met you at a Close Rikers event at the New York Historical Society many, 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 many years ago. And I remember you saying, you know, like, there's a lot of focus on Close Rikers, Close Rikers, but everyone forgets about the build communities part. Um, and it's been really powerful to hear, to be have this conversation today and to have build communities and invest in communities and invest in the resources that keep people really safe, mm-hmm. um, you know, getting as much billing as the fact that we also need to close these jails. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I think that's a testament to, to, um, you know, the amount of work that, that you and others have, have put into this. So thank you very much for, for joining us today and having this conversation. And, you know, I really challenge anyone who listens to this episode not to get involved. I don't know how they could after hearing what you both have shared with us today. So I really want to thank you for bringing your, your expertise and your experience to us on Dismantling Injustice. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Thanks again for joining us. Dismantling Injustice is brought to you by Envision Freedom Fund, an organization that works to transform the immigration and criminal legal systems while meeting the critical needs of individuals impacted by these systems daily. To learn more about our work and donate, visit us at envisionfreedom.org. That's envisionfreedom.org. Dismantling Injustice was created by Sally Israel. Our executive producer is Abigail Wolf and hosted by Carl Hammond Lipscomb. That's me. Special thanks to the team at Envision Freedom for being amazing. Until we're all free, peace out.